We are going to take a look at the location where Dhulkarnain built that dam or that wall against the tribe of Yajuj or Majuj or Gog and Magog. And not only we are going to look at the location, but we are going to actually see the wall that he built. Now some of you might think that it is impossible to see that wall because that wall might be hidden and it will be revealed in Akhir Zaman as some people have preached in their bayan or in their khutbat on different occasions which of course I have seen as well. But what we need to do is we need to take a look at a hadith and Quran to know the facts that what the reality of the matter is. So in order to do so, I will start with a hadith with an incident which is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. Now in this hadith, there is an incident mentioned where a Sahabi during the lifetime of Prophet ﷺ went to the place where Zulkarnain had built this wall and he saw it. Now in this hadith it is mentioned that a man told the Prophet ﷺ that he had seen the dam of Gog and Magog. The Prophet ﷺ asked, how did you find it? The man said, I found it like Burdul Muhabir or a striped garment. The Prophet ﷺ said that yes, you have seen it. Now it is clear from this hadith that the companion of Prophet ﷺ saw the wall built by Dhulkarnain to stop the tribes of Gog and Magog with his own eyes. So if a Sahabi can see it, I guess so can we. And then he explained that it was like a striped garment. Now as we can see from these graphics that a striped garment is being represented. But of course this is just an assumption. But it is striped but it is a little of course different. Now in some other narrations, it also states that this wall had guards standing on top of it who were guarding this wall and they also had tools which they used to fix this wall. So inshallah when we will move forward, you will be able to see for yourself why the Sahabi mentioned this wall in this way. There is also an other narration, an incident in which Hazrat Umar Anhu asked Hazrat Huzaifa ibn Yaman about the trials and tribulations. So he started off with explaining that evil will increase in the world but then he quickly asked again that no, I am talking about the fitna which will come as waves. He actually wanted to know that whether the people of Gog and Magog or the tribe of Gog and Magog will come out because of his fault or they will come out on his own. He knew something that during his time he will come face to face with these tribes. And he also sent reconnaissance missions and an expedition later on to this area, which is of course a record of Islamic history. So one thing becomes clear after studying all these facts, that the understanding of the Sahaba of this subject was quite different to what we have today. And of course there is also another hadith in which Hazur mentions the breaking of this wall and a hole being made in this wall which has been repeated again and again in Bukhari Sharif. But usually people when mention this hadith they quickly refer to another narration which is about the Yajuj Majuj breaking that wall and unable to do so until the day when they say Inshallah and the next day they will be able to break through. This is actually a narration by a Sahabi which is based on the study of Israeliyat. Meaning this narration or this observation was taken from Jewish understanding of the subject, which has also been mentioned by another reputable scholar known as Yasser Qadi in his recent lectures. Although he might not be right about a lot of things, but he was right about this one. So from all these narrations and ahadith, we can clearly see that there is a difference of understanding between the understanding of the Sahaba and the understanding which we have of this subject today. The main reason behind that difference is that usually people present opinions as facts. And when these opinions are presented to people, rather than looking at the facts or looking at a hadith or the subject in Quran, we look at the opinions of the people and their stature in the community. And instead of researching the subject ourselves, we totally rely on the words of others. And of course, the best practice would be that we should follow first Quran, then a Hadith, and then we can follow history, we can follow science, and all the other opinions which people might have. But if the opinion of people or even history are different from a Hadith and Quran, then I think the best possible way should be that we should revisit the subject according to Quran and Hadith. During the recording of history, there are also many biases 
present which we need to look out for. For example, in Assyrian history we have seen this many times happen again and again that a battle is being fought and we can see that the Assyrians are losing this battle and they are being slaughtered and massacred but in the end they will always write that we returned home victorious although we can clearly see that they have lost that battle but still this is a way that people used to record history and they still do so sometimes what happens is we build these walls in our heads and the truth might be on the other side but because of these walls it cannot get through so what i would request all of you is to keep an open mind and put your trust in quran and ahadith and then we can move forward and this might sometimes be a little difficult there is a saying that says truth will set you free but if you have been believing the wrong things for a long time then the truth might be even a little painful but still i urge you to keep an open mind while studying this subject and inshallah things will become clearer as we move forward another misconception is that gog and magog are some supernatural beings some different creatures and i have even heard people saying that they might be zombies however this is not the case and the evidence is in another hadith so this hadith is also in sahih bukhari reference number 3348 so the hadith states the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said allah will say on the day of resurrection o adam adam will reply labbaik wa sadaik allah will say bring out the people of the fire so this means that on the day of resurrection allah subhanahu wa taala will ask hazrat adam alaihi salam to bring forth the people who are going to go to hell fire adam will say oh allah how many people are the people of the fire allah will reply from every 1000 take out 999 so this means that from every 1000 people 999 are going to be those who are going to go to hell fire and then the hadith goes on stating that this will cause a lot of stress a lot of pain and anguish to the people present over there at the moment and one will see mankind as drunken yet they will not be drunken but dreadful will be the wrath of allah so this is actually one of the hadith that keeps me up at night and it gives us a lot to think about so of course this hadith was being narrated to the sahaba and the interaction the dialogue between the sahaba and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is something that we need to think about The companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked, "O oh Allah's apostle, who is that one? Meaning who will be that one person who will be going to heaven?" He said, "Rejoice with glad tidings. One person will be from you." So what does this mean? Does this mean that only the companions of Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam are going to be the ones who are going to enter Jannah? So what about the rest of us? This actually becomes clear when you go further. This actually means that if you follow the way of the sahaba if you follow prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as sahaba did you will also be entering jannah which of course becomes clear when you read the rest of the hadith so in the hadith it is stated that the 999 out of the 1000 will be from gog and magog so one thing that we need to think about over here is the entire world from the people of gog and magog gog and magog of course is a japhetic race and the arabs are a semitic race and even during the lifetime of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam there were many wars that were fought between the arabs meaning the muslim arabs and the kufar arabs but are they also genealogically from the gog and magog tribe of course the answer is no so what does this mean this means that the people who will sin who will reject the word of allah who will reject the sayings of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and will not follow him as the sahaba did all of them will be accumulated in one group and that group will be the group of gog and magog as we all know the famous narration that you will be risen with the people who you follow so this also comes in the same context may allah make us those inshallah who will go to heaven and not the hell fire and not be a part of the gog and magog tribe or the gog and magog system so one thing to think about over here that how are we going to be deceived or how are we going to play into the trap of gog and magog one example that i would like to give over here which will later on become more clearer is the example of the money that we use today in the earlier days money used to be gold and silver but now money is paper and paper money is nothing except debt 
debt that has interest on it yani sood and we all indulge in the use of this fake paper currency and consequently the debt and interest related to it and most of us during our lifetimes don't even think about this matter and this matter is also related with the fitna of gog and magog which inshallah will become more clearer as things progress so apart from islamic sources what other sources do we have which have the mention of gog and magog gog and magog have not only been mentioned in quran or hadith they have also been mentioned in the torah and also in the history books like that which has been written by herodotus and he also called them scythians and these people are also known as khazars all these terms are very important in understanding of this subject and apart from the mention of herodotus who was also known as the father of history round about in 300 bc these people have also been mentioned in the assyrian text round about 700 bc and these people have been mentioned as invaders which came from the north of the caucasus and they used to kill people they used to take their gold and silver they used to take people and then sell them off as slaves so this was their business and that is why they spread corruption in the land which has also been mentioned in the quran but one thing that is common in history and in religion is that they used to reside on the northern side of the caucasus so what we get because of that is a geographical location an end point so of course wherever zulkarnain built his wall it must be a little before that because the wall was built to stop these people so because of this we get two main points one point of course being that wall which was built on the northern side of caucasus and the second point is the location of zulkarnain which we have already mentioned in a previous video that zulkarnain was called zulkarnain because he joined parsa and media and that was the basis of the persian empire so we have a starting point and an ending point and in the holy quran we also have two other major indicators so inshallah in the next video we will go through step by step through each ayat and explain where zulkarnain went and how and where he finally built that wall to stop the people of gog and magog